there we are. Yes, so good evening and uh, welcome back. It's, a, it's been a while since we've done one of the classes structured like this. So meeting together with different teachers, back to what we had done a ways before. Uh, some of you just finished a big week. Uh, a lot of classes that we just had with a local mini conference in Singapore. And so for those of you that were able to do that, um, thank you for your time and thank you for your interest. Thank you very much for your, just your interest in the Word of God and uh, spending that time. I enjoyed those lectures very much. I hope you did as well. Uh, very challenging information, thick information, but helpful. So um, I have high regard and high appreciation for, for what Dr. Collins gave us. And we'll be hearing from Dr. Collins later on uh, coming up in this class as well. If you missed that, here I'll pull the link up for you. The, the mini conference was four sessions, but they were three hours. <laughs> Uh, three hours, four three-hour sessions on eschatology, and so that was held locally um, in Singapore, but then we were able to, to live stream it as well, and you can watch all of those here at that link, so if you missed some of those. He worked, uh, worked through Revelation rather carefully, but then that branched him out into Daniel, Zechariah, um, the Olivet Discourse. We spent a good time in the Olivet, a good amount of time in the Olivet Discourse, so some good content there, just some good things that happen. All right, um, I want to jump right in and use your time well. And so we should open with a word of prayer. And then I'm, I'm delighted about the things that we're about to look at together. So let's pray. Our Father, we thank you tonight for the privilege again of looking into your word. Thank you for the rich, the richness of the documents that you have given us of your word, you speaking. Thank you that as we read these words, uh, we are again and again confirmed and convinced that these are not and cannot be the words of mere human beings, but that the richness of all of this, and the beauty of all of this, and the, the accuracy of it all demands our faith. And so we come again, another facet of the richness of your word, understanding how scripture relates to itself, how it connects together, and seeing the way these pieces fit together. We come with delight, we come with a great sense of privilege and gratefulness, and we ask that you would help us in the coming weeks, that we would really truly rejoice in the richness of what you have spoken to us here. Help us to see what you have said and to love it and to be grateful for it. And we ask this all in your son's name. Amen. Okay. Um, so let me, just to get us going here tonight, let me put up the overall schedule of what we have coming up. And I want to show you then the teachers that we're looking forward to and some of the information that they're going to share with us as we go. So um, here's, and I can send this to you as a link as well if you'd like it that way. Um, in fact, I'll go ahead and copy, wrong link, copy it out as a, a scheme or a URL in just a second. Um, but here, tonight we're looking at October 14th. We're doing an overview of intertextuality. Uh, the next class will meet on October 17th, so this Thursday. And this is Sam Saldivar on Jonah and Canonical Theology. Um, October 21st, Andy Nicelli. And this is actually his dissertation topic. So he's done quite a bit of work in this field. And uh, we'll, I'll look, we'll look later on in an essay that he was part of contributing to that's related to this. Um, so that's coming up next week, one week from today. Mark Ward talking about the New Testament and the links between the Septuagint and the Masoretic text. And so how some of those pieces fit together. This is more of a traditional biblical theology kind of category that Jonathan, Ta Jonathan Brufall will be giving, giving us. Um, and that is, again, directly related to his dissertation. So that was basically the topic that he worked on. Uh, Mark Lehman, again, another more of a biblical, general biblical theology topic, more so than like an intertextuality topic, but talking about marriage and sexual ethics across scripture, which is really relevant for sure right now when you're thinking of all the ways that this is be being distorted in our societies. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Uh, Jonathan Lehman is a missionary in Mexico, and he's done quite a bit of work with the Pentateuch and themes there. And so we'll be talking through a biblical theology uh, in some of, with some of those themes. November 11th, actually, there, there are a couple of details that I'm working out there. So we have a couple of options, um, and I'll tell you about one of those options later on. David, David Minnick talking about inter and intertextuality specifically in Revelation. We heard some discussion of this from his dissertation. It was thick, a lot of content coming fast. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm glad to get back into that and hear it in a little bit more of a digestible way, just so that it's not so overwhelming. But that will be coming up as well. Kim Casillas on the law. He wrote a book on the law, uh, The Christian and the Law, how these relate to each other. Then Brian Collins on a biblical theology of the land, and later Brian Collins on, Collins on the hermeneutical implications of Galatians 4.24. This is that passage that talks about, um, this is a uh, allegory. And so it's a, it's a kind of a complicated passage. And so he'll be helping us with some of that. Okay, so that's the schedule, what we've got coming up. Um, and all of these are directly related to biblical theology type discussions, though, a number of the lectures were specifically going after the issues of textu uh, intertextuality. So here's my schedule for tonight. My, my goal tonight and my stated themes for this was an overview of intertextuality. And that's where I wanna start, obviously. Um, stop talking about for a few minutes, what is intertextuality? How do we get the concepts in our mind, just the basic beginnings, foundations? to get us started through this process. And then my hope is here laying the framework for where we will go with the other discussions in the, in the other classes. So uh, let me show you my outline for tonight and I can give this to you. Uh, I guess I'll have to export it as a PDF, but I can send that out to you during the break. Or um, let's see, how quickly can I do it right now? I can give it to you in PDF form. Well, I'll start with uh, this. So we'll just look at it on screen for a little bit. Start out, uh, here's my overall desire or my plan for the class overall. Um, so starting out here, some recommended sources. Oops. Uh, and then these are the topics that we'll talk about. Let me show you that in a just more easily digestible form. So here's our big picture outline for the evening. What is intertextuality? getting a definition for it, recognizing the phenomenon, uh, finding forms of intertextuality, and even kind of trying to quantify how widespread it is. How to study intertextuality, the problem of intertextuality, the theological implications of it, and then the practical use, or how we can actually use this in our own personal study, teaching, preaching, explaining the Bible. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a little starting quiz, if I may. And I'll give it to you in just 30 second or one minute form. Um, I would like everyone, uh, yeah, I would like everyone to give me your best shot, what is intertextuality in the first place? And a very, very legitimate answer is don't know. Not sure, I've only heard the term, don't know what it means, or I've not heard the term, okay? But just to get us an idea of a starting point, if you were gonna, try to toss out a definition of the word, or even if the answer is don't know, great, no problem. But let's get everyone in the chat and give me some feedback there. When you hear intertextuality, uh, what's immediately coming to your mind? Okay, so I've got one comment so far. Uh, New Testament use of the Old Testament. Anyone else? I know that there's, there are other answers out there. Okay, between two or more kind of texts. Great. A passage quoting to, quoting, alluding to, or echoing another uh, passage. Good. Compare one passage with another. Great. How scripture quotes itself across the Testaments. Excellent. Very good. Um, just looking, let's see, connections between texts and relationships. Great. 
Um, good. Okay. Great. These are these are excellent. Uh, these are really really excellent uh, descriptions of what we've got going on with the phenomena. Okay. Good. Uh, let me show you my definition. Uh, my yeah, my best attempt at trying to work through this and understand this myself. Um, so, what is intertextuality? And um, I came up with this answer as a definition of intertextuality, which is actually, this is not mine, this is taken from others. Um, intertextuality is a literary phenomenon in which an author links his work with a pre-existing work or a pre-existing text by means of verbal or syntactic congruities. Uh, a number of the, the statements in that are kind of a little bit of nerd speak, and so if you'll forgive those, <laughs> that's good. Um, but just breaking it down, it's a literary thing. It's a common thing and a point I would like to make about intertextuality. Any good, skillful author will do this, I would suggest. If they're writing, you know, at length, they're pulling in um, ideas from other texts, maybe texts of their own. And so if you have a series, like, I don't know, you had the Harry Potter series and J.K. Rowling, um, well, she pulled in things from previous books. And so you, you, you ended up, you know, book four, having pieces that pulled in from book one and things like that, okay? So there's interdependencies and, and such. But not just that, a good author also is making literary references or maybe just using, you know, an idiom or, or some kind of idea that reminds you of a previous work. I just read a children's work recently. Uh, it's like The Call of the Something. <laughs> I, do tear, I read books and I don't remember the names. Um, but it was, a, it was a, like a teen level book and I read it because my son was reading it and I thought it'd be fun. And as I read it, I got part way through and I realized this is the David story. And he's doing the David story just in another form. And so you picked up little pieces where he went down to fight this giant and as he went down to fight the giant, he picked up five stones. And, okay, come on, this is David. Um, but he was doing it on purpose. So that kind of phenomena where you're linking your work together with another work, especially these two last pieces, verbal or syntactic congruities, where you find repeated words or similar grammar in some way that makes you think on purpose these things are tied in there. Uh, part of the context for this, uh, the term interact textuality was first coined in 1969, having to do with how texts interact with their subtext and making a link between different works, kind of taking, it's almost like an internet link, internet link, but taking two works and connecting them, locking them together. And by that here, 1969, she's not doing this as a biblical scholar. Uh, she invented this word, or this word first became com common in the literary word, world. And so one thing uh, that is, yeah, um, just a discussion that happens with intertextuality is whether it's really good to use the word in biblical studies. So the term is bound up here with broader issues that are related to postmodernism and some denial of foundationalism. The idea being, well, every text uh, is dependent on the reader's viewpoint, the author's viewpoint is kind of muted beneath the reader's viewpoint. And so we just give up on trying to establish clear meaning, as in, what does this text say? You can't say. We just have communities that think what texts say, and so forth. And so some biblical writers will say, within biblical studies, we shouldn't even be using this because the term is not even, a, maybe not even a good term for what we're actually doing in biblical studies. Whether it's a good choice of term or not, it's here. It exists now and it's used that way. And so I think the reality as it's formed up is that using intertextuality outside of biblical studies is going to mean one thing, Using intertextuality within biblical studies will mean another thing. And so generally, when we say the word in biblical studies, what we mean by it are some of the things that you told me. Uh, things like a text between Old Testament and New Testament, or how scripture quotes itself across the Testaments. Uh, connections between texts and relationships and things like that. Um, I'm even wondering from the last thing in the chat uh, from Brother Nelly Chan, Connections between texts and relationships makes me think maybe you're coming more from the literary, general literary world than the biblical scholarship world where we're using it a slightly different way. Uh, comment I meant skipped here. Richard Hayes in 1989 brought it into biblical studies, which, okay, now pay attention to the dates. 1989, not very long ago in the big picture of things. 
So the, the term and the concept and actually the strong interest that's happening right now um, is all connected in to just pretty recent stuff. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is not a very old concept at all in terms of the discussion. Brother Duncan Johnson just asked me if I can share writers who are not super happy with it. I was reading, um, <laughs> they're kind of getting mixed up in my mind, but it was G.K. Beale, I'm pretty sure. Uh, yes, it was. It was G.K. Beale, and it was the last section of like chapter three, maybe. I can find it later. And he has a little excursus where he talks about this issue. Um, so he, he gives the, the backdrop for why other people don't like it and explains a little bit about why it's actually still used within with the studies. So um, if you take a look at that, I think it's like the end of chapter two or maybe chapter three. I'm going to say chapter three. Uh, he's got that excursus and he'll give you more discussion. If I look, I might be able to find it quickly here. Uh, let's see. Looks like I might be looking for it at the end of now. All right, so anyway, it's somewhere around there. <laughs> it's the end of, end of one of the chapters where he's giving you an excursus specifically on that. All right, I don't know if that helps. Um, all right, next point I'd like to make is discussing intertextuality, uh, inter intertextuality a little bit. Um, so, you know what, I skipped. I'm sorry. Uh, well, we'll come back. I need to talk about sources, but I'll do that after this section. So, intertextuality, some of you in your chat gave me a fine answer. Um, and the fine answer to be made here is you said it's the New Testament quoting the Old Testament, uh, which, great. I actually want to argue intertextuality is not only Old Testament to New Testament, but it's broader than that. It actually is any time scripture is citing or referencing itself. And not, I'm not trying to be overcritical of the answers because uh, that's a fine answer as well. And it, a lot of times it's used that way, but I'm gonna argue more broadly. So we can find things going on where yes, I have New Testament quotations from the Old Testament, very common. That's probably, the, that is the primary way we think of this. And we will spend most of our time in this class discussing those kinds of settings. But let's just take a little time here to try to demonstrate that it can also be quotations within the same testament. And so we're looking at a ph phenomena that, that spreads all the way across the Bible. In other words, I can go to the Old Testament and be talking about intertextuality as well. Um, so Old Testament quoting the New Testament first. Let's go there. Um, I'll show you here. I'm going to show you a document. And this is, I did this for a different class. Um, but this document is showing you the interrelationship between the covenants. And so it's showing you that all of the major covenants are tied together in deep, significant ways. Some of the ways that they're tied together are actually intertextuality kind of concepts. So what I've got across the top here, for starters, Abrahamic Davidic New Covenant. And then just to explain the concept, we're going down the page. So it's Abrahamic going down, Davidic going down, you can see the colors and that kind of thing lines up. And then what I'm doing is I'm, so this is from the top, so it's kind of like a grid. And then from the side here going across horizontally, then I've got different themes that are tying the covenants together. Okay, and um, I'm happy to, I'm happy to put this in the Dropbox as well for you if you're interested in it, because this is, I think, a diagram that's useful not just for intertextuality. Um, so here, uh, Abrahamic, I will make your name great. Davidic, I will make for you a great name. Okay, New Covenant is not as explicit, but this is the name by, by which you will be called the Lord is our righteousness, some kind of name linkage to the Messiah. The seed is huge. I will establish my covenant between you and your offspring after you. I will establish your offspring forever. And then after all of this is done, they are an offspring the Lord has blessed. Okay. Um, here's a very interesting instance of intertextuality stretching across. Not, the Davidic doesn't happen here, but the Abrahamic. I will show to, surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven, as the sand that is on the seashore. And now Jeremiah 33. As the hosts of heaven cannot be numbered, and the sands of the sea cannot be measured, so I will multiply the offspring of David, my servant. So something that happened back here in Genesis, and by the way, um, you recognize that goes even back further to like Genesis 1, 26 and 28, 
that, you know, fill the earth and be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. But then David's blessing, or Abraham's blessing, is echoed in the new blessing, the new covenant blessing. The land, to your offspring I will give this land. I will appoint a place so that they may dwell in their place. I will gather you out of the countries where you have been scattered. I will give you the land of Israel. The foreverness, an everlasting covenant. Your throne shall be established forever. I will make with you an everlasting covenant. In your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. The Lord will be king over all the earth. You shall call a nation that you do not know. The international kind of uh, notion. So there's a number of these that maybe are not as obviously intertextuality. They're more thematic. This is very explicit intertextuality. You've got verbal stuff going on there. Words that are matching up. And even, I think, the seed is strikingly intertextuality. I mean, it's, it's, it's developing some kind of strand that's going through. Um, the land, arguably. Uh, here, the, the idea of the great name. Okay, so that's just one attempt. <laughs> one example of something that is pretty deep into our, our whole concepts and our whole understanding of Scripture that has some intertextuality component to it. That what's going on here is texts that are echoing each other. Right? Let's take another example. What I'm doing here is I'm going to compare uh, Genesis and actually change my mind. I'm going to start by comparing uh, not Genesis and Revelation. Let's start with the, the flood and Genesis. Okay, so um, let me put that up here. If you start paying attention to the Genesis narrative where God has created the world, and then you pay attention to the flood narrative, you start finding important echoes or important resonances that are between the two. So uh, Genesis 1, the spirit of God moved over the face of the waters. The, God made a wind blow over the earth. To every beast of the earth, to every bird, to every creeping thing, everything that has the breath of life, well, bring out with you every living thing that is of all flesh, birds, animals, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, that they may swarm and be fruitful and multiply. Over here, be fruitful and multiply. Cursed is the ground. Over here, I will never again curse the ground. Later, you do get a curse when uh, the, this thing happens with Noah. He's drunk and then comes in and he curses Canaan. God blessed them. God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. God blessed Noah and his son, said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fear the, fill the earth. Okay. And I would keep on reading, except it's just time. Strong echoes across here. God created man in his own image. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply the earth. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. You be fruitful, multiply, increase greatly on the earth and multiply in it. You've got the nakedness in Genesis. You've got the nakedness in, uh, in Genesis 2. You've got the nakedness in Genesis 9 when he's drunk. And then you've got the curse here, Genesis 3, and you've got the curse over here. Okay. So... You come away with this, and if you paid attention to the flow or the things that are going on here, um, you're supposed to be quite impressed that Genesis 2, 1 through 3, and Genesis 9 through 11, the Noah story, are linked. And the reason that this is important that they're linked, God creates the world good, sin corrupts the world. Noah is supposed to be kind of, is this a new beginning? Wash the whole earth clean, right? wipe it all out, start over again from nothing. And maybe then a cleanly washed earth, you'll get a good beginning. And the answer is no. The problem with humans is deeper than that. Right? So there's supposed to be a resonance. You're supposed to get to Genesis 9 to 11 and start recalling Genesis 2, 1 to 3. They're supposed to tie together. Okay, I'll give you another example. Can't remember if I have two examples or another one after that. Um, so this is Genesis and Revelation now. And what we're tying together is from the original creation to the new creation. And we get, again, deep resonances. So God created the heavens and the earth. Revelation, there's a new heaven and a new earth. God moved above the water, face of the waters, no more sea. Okay, you could reject that one. I think it's convincing enough to me, but it's, if you don't like it, no problem. Um, God would walk with them in the cool of the day. Okay, eventually God drove out the man. Over here, the dwelling place of God is with men. The gold and precious stones in Genesis almost feel weird. Do you remember this? It says there is gold there, also precious stones between these two rivers. It almost, what, what's that about? Well, gold and precious gems in the New Jerusalem. I don't think these things are accidental. You have the two rivers recorded. In Revelation, you have the river of the water of life. If you eat it, you will die, the curse. No more death, tears, mourning, crying, or pain. When they do eat of it, they are cursed. 
but specifically and separately, Revelation says in a sec separately, there is no more curse. You have the tree of life in Genesis. You have the tree of life in Revelation. God created the sun, moon, and stars as signs for day and night. There is no day or night in the New Jerusalem because the Lord is their light. Um, so these resonances are strong enough that you come away convinced that when John is writing Revelation, he has to be thinking of Genesis. And apologetically, I would say that this resonance is so powerful and so clear. I even want to go the other way that in some cases, it's not just that Moses randomly wrote Genesis, and then John later came in and tried to match it. But I want to argue that there's divine authorship over here, that God is already baking things in in Genesis. Some details that would seem odd, like the gold and precious stones and the rivers. I think God is baking that in in Genesis with the intention of Revelation someday picking those things up. And so there becomes a very important apologetic role that stands behind intertextuality, arguments like this. Why on earth, how could this be so perfect, the resonance that stretches across those two extremes? Okay, um, and I believe there, oh, there's one more here that's kind of interesting. Um, I'm pulling this in, and I'll try to clean up my window here a little bit before I toss it up there. There's an interesting pattern that happens if you are paying attention in the Old Testament to this phrase, by a strong hand, I, I did not by, by any means get all of these. These are, I only got some of them here. Um, but here, I know that the king of Egypt will not go unless compelled by a mighty hand. That, by the way, mighty, it's, it's the, English, the English translation, at least ESV, is inconsistent. It's the same word. Okay, mighty hand or strong hand. Um, in fact, at least I believe it is. Somebody can check me, maybe I'm wrong. Um, but I believe it's the same word here. Uh, he, unless compelled by a mighty hand. So by a strong hand, the Lord brought you out of this place. Okay, Exodus 13, what does this mean? By a strong hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt, you'll tell your children. It shall be a mark on your hand and frontlets between your eyes. For by a strong hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt. And later, Deuteronomy 4.34, by a mighty hand, an outstretched hand, God did all of these things for you in Egypt for your eyes. Okay, this is by no means all of them. If you keep on going, you actually find this equation popping up later in the prophets. And that mighty hand, strong hand kind of concept becomes this little marker going back to the Exodus. And so when you're reading and you encounter strong hand, mighty hand concepts, you're looking at an Exodus reference. There's some things on here that are going on purpose. Okay, um, I'm just looking back through a couple of chat things because I want to make sure I get some of this stuff that you asked. Um, there was a comment here, uh, and I just want to make sure I'm, I'm clear on this. I mentioned how this term only became rel or common in biblical studies, 1989, uh, and so forth. I want to clarify, the term intertextuality became a thing in 1989. People have been aware, picking up on this and studying this for a long, long, long time. I'll give you two works from the 1800s that are free, <laughs> you can download, um, and all of those are doing, they're doing the same work. They're just not using the word intertextuality. So I, I wanna be clear, I don't mean by that, the phenomena is a newly studied thing. The phenomena is very old, all the way back into the fathers. The fathers know this. Well, the New Testament, anyway, right? I mean, the New Testament is recognized. It's very obvious that this is happening. Um, just the term is more recent as in the last 30 years. And secondarily, the focus on it as in more of a, a thing that people are really thinking about, it's kind of a hot field right now, or maybe was more of a hot field a little bit ago. Um, but it's thing that, a thing that people are still really interested in and doing a lot of discussion, in a, maybe in a way that they hadn't discussed in the past. So there are definitely insights and uh, new kinds of analysis that are being made recently. Okay, um, I'm looking through, uh, there was a question here about Paul quoting the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, yes. We'll see it. In fact, we're gonna, so we're going to look in just a little bit at New Testament quoting New Testament. So New Testament quoting itself, and we'll see some of those. Points. Good. Very good questions. Thanks. Okay, um, so let me jump over, and let's look at uh, one or two more examples of Old Testament quoting Old Testament. I'll show you my outline again. Um, this is fascinating. Within only a few verses, 
Daniel references both Jeremiah, so Daniel 9, 12, and Jeremiah 25. Multiple passages in the Mosaic Covenant, many other passages, including all of these passages right here. Okay. Um, and you can do more. What this is, this is Daniel chapter 9. And so we just looked at this last week with Dr. Collins. Uh, that passage that ends with the 77s, the 490, okay, that passage. Um, the first part of that passage is this prayer, this long prayer from Daniel. And you can read that passage, Daniel chapter 9, and it, it's like an overview of the Old Testament built into a prayer. It's profoundly rich with all of these Old Testament references. It feels a bit like in Acts, Stephen's defense, Stephen's sermon, and remember he just call, recalls Israel's history and he just walks through. Daniel's prayer feels like that. It feels like Daniel is doing this deep summary of the entire Old Testament and Old Testament theology. Okay? And it's just thick with all of these kinds of references. Here's another set of passages that's interesting. Um, let me put that up, put this up for you. So give me a second. Okay. Um, so here we've got uh, Moses, the servant of God, commanded the people, as it is written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of uncut stones, and they offered on it burnt, burnt offerings. Um, as it, excuse me, okay, I know where we're going. As it is written in the book of the law of Moses. Up here, I get a little further. As it is written in the book of the law of Moses. I get up here to 2 Kings 14, 6. The book of the law of Moses, according to all that is written in the book of the law of Moses. Um, and that's just like a very brief illustration of this book of the law of Moses kind of concept that goes all the way through the Pentateuch. Constant kind of pattern with that happening across the Old Testament. Okay, um, all of those passages I just gave you were my attempts to demonstrate that the Old Testament does quote itself. And so we're not just talking about a New Testament quoting Old Testament thing. When we do intertextuality, I might have something later in the Old Testament quoting something earlier in the Old Testament. And so if Daniel references Genesis, Daniel references Deuteronomy, that was intertextuality. If I find a phrase that gets repeated, repeated all the way through the Old Testament, that was intertextuality. It's not just between the Testaments. It's within the Testaments as well. Any questions there? Um, I'm just looking through and, uh, okay. Uh, I don't see any comments there. If you have them, drop them in. Feel free to drop them into the chat. So hit the outline again. Um, all of that was quotations within the same Testament, Old Testament quoting the, New, the Old Testament. Let's look at New Testament quoting itself. And so this was Pastor, Hal I believe it was Pastor Halaris' question just a second ago. Do I find the New Testament quoting itself or Paul quoting uh, the Gospels? Let's look at a couple of examples. This is interesting. Uh, Luke 22, 19 to 20 with 1 Corinthians 11, 24, 25. So what I'm getting here is an initial example. Excuse me. Uh, initial example of this kind of concept. Luke 22 I think, you know, we know this. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this, do this in remembrance of me. This cup is poured out, is the new covenant in my blood. Okay? That's Luke 22. When I get to 1 Corinthians 11, you've got Paul now referencing the history of what happened. And, you know, this is the passage actually that we typically quote where we're doing the Lord's Supper, but we're actually quoting Paul. And the flow of the passage is just quoting, I mean, really, word for word. So it's giving you the sense. Um, some really strong resonances here, whether Paul is going back and, and he's drawing from the Gospels, the synoptics themselves, or whether he's drawing from some other source, it doesn't make a difference, whether he just knows this by inspiration or, you know, however that is, it doesn't matter. But the closeness of how these link up, even verbally, is, I think, supposed to be striking, okay? So that's one example of intertextuality I might not think of very much as intertextuality. Here's another, maybe even more striking example. First Timothy 5, let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double, double honor, especially those who labor in teaching and preaching and teaching. The scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain and labor deserves his wages. Okay, great. Uh, so we're assuming both of those find some Old Testament reference. Well, sure. Deuteronomy 25, you shall not muzzle an ox when it is treading out the grain. So the scripture says, and he references Deuteronomy 25.4. What's striking now is the second 
and the ESV has given it away to us because it gave us in red letters. The laborer does not, the laborer deserves his wages um, is drawn from Luke 10, and it's Jesus' words. So between these two, the first one is an Old Testament citation. The second is a New Testament citation, both under the heading for the scripture says. And there's not any distinction here. Somebody can kind of wiggle around it if they really want to, and they can say that Paul meant the scripture says, referring to the first and not the second. Okay, but that's, that's an arbitrary distinction because the way that he's linked these up, he's put these together in parallel under the heading that the scripture says. And so he's just referred to Deuteronomy and Luke together as equally scripture. Okay, but what's striking about it now is that I have two different kinds of intertextuality happening in one verse because the one kind of intertextuality is an intertextuality back to the Old Testament. The other is an intertextuality back to the New Testament. When I say they're two different kinds, they're not fundamentally different, but they're just categories that we don't normally think of. And so if we understood intertextuality, strictly speaking, as New Testament, Old Testament, we miss stuff like this. That is clearly intertextuality, this kind of thing going on within the New Testament itself. Um, another interesting example here would be the Johannine books. Um, and so if we're thinking about uh, the opening to each one of the, the books by John, we find this kind of interesting, or excuse me, not the opening, but uh, an interesting pattern with this. John 13, 34, Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. Okay, so I get to 1 John 2, 7. Behold, I'm writing no new commandment, but an old commandment which you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I'm writing to you, which is true in him and in, in, in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Um, and I'm sorry, I should give you context here so you can see where it goes. Where it's going to go is talking about loving your brother. Okay. Well, if you don't know about this form of intertextuality up here, all of this is confusing. I'm giving you an old commandment. Actually, it's a new commandment, but it's old. <laughs> and all of the idea makes sense now if you rec recognize Jesus saying, I'm giving you a new commandment. And then John is saying, I'm giving you a new commandment. Well, Jesus gave it as a new commandment. Actually, you've had it for a long time now because you received Jesus' word. So to you now, it's basically an old commandment. But anyway, I'll reference the new commandment from Jesus. That's what's going on in the passage. So suddenly this can make sense if you're paying attention to the a new commandment that you love one another in John 13. Okay. Um, so it's, it's, it's actually really helpful for your interpretation of 1 John 2, 7. And then if you get to 2 John 5, uh, I, now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we have from the beginning. So this new commandment language echoing Jesus' new commandment comment up here, but you had it from the beginning, meaning all the way back to Jesus' ministry, that we love one another. Anyway, this is clear intertextuality. John is tying together new commandment, love, those three things. No question. It's, it's an unquestionable example of intertextuality that's going on between these three. Okay. Um, one or two others that we're talking about within then the framework of, of the New Testament. Something that goes a little further is something David Minnick developed. And it was a new concept to me, but I found it helpful. Uh, he talked about intra-textuality. And so he's coining his own word, um, but it was helpful to me. Typically, when we say intertextuality, we mean by that uh, this book referencing that book, so stretching across two different books. Intra-textuality, his idea was a book referencing itself. And so within Revelation, you have a bunch of this, where Revelation sets out the theme and then it echoes it a bunch of times. Um, clearly, intertextuality would imply a fairly large book. I'm not going to expect this in Philemon or Second John, <laughs> because there's just not enough space to have a theme and then repeat it a bunch of times. So, I mean, there are some things like that, it's particularly Second John and Third John. But we would be thinking something big enough that you see this kind of scale. And so I would say some particularly interesting forms of this is the Luke-Acts link. Uh, Luke and Acts, Volume 1, Volume 2, they're separate books-ish but they're really one book or one, wor one work, which one of the most important things you can help people 
to understand Luke Acts is to help them get that. They don't, for some reason, a lot of our people in our churches don't know that, but they should. Luke and Acts are volume one, volume two of the same book. Okay. Um, so if you start looking at Luke Acts, you find these themes of the kingdom, good news, salvation, progress up to Jerusalem versus Acts, progress from Jerusalem, the Holy Spirit, prayer, discipleship, okay, a bunch of these themes. And what gets really, really interesting here is that you discover Jesus de develops the theme of the kingdom, then the apostles go preach it. Jesus proclaims good news and salvation, then the apostles go spread it. Jesus brings every, Luke and Acts is like an hourglass on this point. Everything is progressing towards Jerusalem, Luke, okay? Then Acts begins, everything goes out from Jerusalem in Acts, okay? And so it becomes an hourglass, this effect between the two books. Uh, the Holy Spirit, Jesus has the Holy Spirit and ministers in the Holy Spirit. So when the apostles are going to minister, they minister in the Holy Spirit. Prayer, Jesus prays. Discipleship, Jesus, Jesus disciples. The apostles go out and they pray and they use the method of discipleship. Okay, so you have resonances between the two. Some of those are thematic and so more in the category of biblical theology. And I'll make that distinction in a little bit. But a lot of these are more than thematic. A lot of these are actual textual. And so that's what I'm wanting to say here. Technically, we're not looking just for themes, which a lot of, some of these are more themes. But we're looking for textual references, so let, let's try that. Uh, take a couple of these, and let's see what the textual references would look like if we connect those in. Uh, so here, Luke 3.16, uh, John answered them all saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is coming is mightier than I. The strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy unto, uh, to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So then Acts 1, Jesus talking. John baptized with water, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And Acts 11, Peter, after Cornelius, uh, I remember just as the beginning, I remember the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with, with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Just to note, this now is about Cornelius, so this is Gentiles. And so Peter is saying, I realized back when Jesus talked about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the whole John the Baptist thing and all those concepts, I realized that linked back to Pentecost. Oh, just kidding. It linked even further to Gentile salvation. And so what Jesus had going on back here, excuse me, more precisely, John the Baptist. What John the Baptist prophesied here is fulfilled in Cornelius and his house receiving the Holy Spirit, as well as Pentecost. Okay. So you discover that the original statement of John is fulfilled and actually, Jesus uh, also apparently quoted this, is fulfilled in ways that you never would have guessed. Jesus prophesied the coming of the Holy Spirit. Surprises happen. The Holy Spirit comes not just on Jews, but also on Gentiles. And there's some, some pretty interesting notes about how some of those go together. Um, good. Yes. How both John and Peter refer to the beginning uh, as from Christ. The, the question that we want to have here fell on us just at the beginning. Some people are going to understand this. And I think I would prefer maybe uh, to think of that as Pentecost um, because it's the Holy Spirit falling on them at the beginning. I'm going to do something like that, but yeah. Um, great. Good. Some good comments here. Just looking back here. Yes. Good. John is referring to Jesus' word when he said this. Good. Uh, Brother Zemdan Leon, you're, inter you're, you're uh, anticipating me too much. Excellent. Great question. He asks, can we write a sermon based on this? And the answer is absolutely, and we'll do that. Uh, or I'll show you some examples of that with the practical use of intertextuality a little bit later on. So great, great question. Uh, one other interesting example here, um, pause, or just take a little um, look here. Acts 20.35 is a particularly challenging example. Um, here we go. Acts 20, 35. In all these, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weaker. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, himself said, is more blessed to give than to receive. Um, so he's quoting Jesus. <laughs> Here's what makes this a good one. We don't know where the quote is. Uh, we don't have it in the Gospels. <laughs> so what we have here is an example of a quote from Jesus without a Gospel record. And that, that doesn't have to do it. doesn't have to create us problems for our doctrine of inspiration or anything. It's just interesting to know. 
that you have a teaching of Jesus that is recorded outside of the Gospels. Um, and apparently, you know, he knew and others knew that Jesus had said this, maybe eyewitnesses or something. But if you go back to the Gospels, you won't find it. Right? So that's an interesting example. It's not technically intertextuality because there is no text for it. <laughs> but it is a reference back to Jesus' words. Okay. Um, let me talk to you briefly about how extensive tech intertextuality is. And uh, in order to do that, let me show you a resource that you ought to know about. And it's a resource I find extremely helpful from Logos. So I'm going to put up here, um, I want to talk about resources a little bit for a moment or two, and then I'll show you the Logos resource for types of intertextuality. Uh, resources you should know about and you should use, I think. First of all, this one, I just think you should buy it. If, if you can, if you're in a position, position where you're able to, you should buy this resource. Bielan Carson, Commentary on the New Testament Use of the Old Testament. Now, it is a nerdy, quite nerdy resource, um, and it's, it's not cheap either. So, now you, you can buy it. Uh, you can pick it up on Logos. You can pick it up on Accordance. So, all of the majors, I think even Olive Tree has it. Uh, all of the major software vendors would have this, and so you can get it that way. Uh, just to show you what it looks like so you can see the cover. Um, I, I see you over there, Brother Kenneth, pulling it down. I'm glad you have it. Good for you. Um, here's the cover, and I think this window will pop up. Commentary on the New Testament Use of the Old Testament by G.K. Beale and D.A. Carson. They're the editors, by the way. Um, so they're actually essays by lots of people. Uh, the way that this is set up, here I'll just show you. You're looking down the books, so Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and so forth. I have it here in electronic form. Um, and then you have by passages. And so if you go to Mark 1, 2, and 3, okay, you're going to look inside of that and you're going to find, uh, let's see if we can pull this out. There we go. You're going to find this kind of analysis, New Testament context, and then some complexity to the citation and how Marx uses it and the theological use of that. Or here we go, New Testament context, Isaiah 64, 1 in context, Isaiah 64, 1 in Judaism. This is pretty, pretty standard for what they do. And then the use of Isaiah 64 and Mark, Mark and theological use. Same thing here, the voice we're having in the New Testament context, then the Old Testament context in Judaism, in its original textual context in the Old Testament, and then how those two tie together, they're going to link them, theological use. They just do this one after another. And if we jump to that specific place, uh, this is what you're looking at. They're giving you the verse, and then they're just going to talk you through what's going on. It's pretty nerdy. Um, and so if, if you're a nerdy type, it's an excellent resource. And all that's going on here is um, if you've ever, I'll do this later, Lord willing, as we have time. If you've ever looked at a New Testament quote, then you go to the Old Testament context and you look at the two and they don't seem to fit. <laughs> it's like, here's the way they used it. There's what it meant. It's not matching. Um, there's a book and it's the right theology from the wrong texts, question mark. And it's about this issue. The, the argument going, were the New Testament writers making good points, but oops, they just twisted the context. And so they weren't actually executing correctly. Um, well, a liberal is going to say that. A liberal is going to say that these guys twisted the Old Testament. And that's a big issue, and you need some answers on that. Okay? Beal and Carson go through every single one of those. And so they, the entire New Testament, they go through all of the big, even, even insignificant, but all of the Old Testament quotations, and they study the Old Testament context, they study the New Testament context, and they tell you how they fit. And so when you hit one of those and you're scratching your head, they're going to solve the problem for you. Okay? They're going to walk you through all of the complexities and answer what's going on. Does that make sense? Um, so we'll keep on going with this, building this concept, this discussion of the problem of intertextuality. Are these writers misusing the New Test or the Old Testament when they quote passages from Okay, uh, I promised you that I was going to show you resources, so before I get into that, let me keep on going showing you resources. So that's excellent, commentary on the New Testament use of the Old. Beale's handbook on the New Testament use of the Old is also excellent as a method. Okay, so this is the commentary. In other words, what they've done, they've gone through the passages and explained each one. This is the handbook 
It's a companion volume. It looks similar, even has a similar looking cover. But what he's done is gone through the, the process or the method or um, how you should be understanding, how you should be studying these texts. So here's a, just a kind of an attempt at a summary of the book. Um, I'm about three fourths of the way through it right now and really enjoying it. A chapter one, summary of the key debate. Chapter two, how can we identify intertextuality when we see it? In other words, how, how do you know this passage is an intertextuality passage? What method should we use when we interpret? Types of intertextuality, ways that the New Testament uses the Old Testament. The underlying pre presuppositions that the authors were using when they do this. How do we find what Judaism did? Uh, a student asking me, how did Jews prior to Christ understand uh, Daniel 9? Okay, well, he's going to talk to you about how you would do that, how you would find that. And then further explanations of method, things from chapter three in a case study. Okay, that, that's kind of a table of contents for that book. It's a good book if you're into this kind of thing. Very good book. Uh, here's another great book, Three Views on the New Testament Use of the Old Testament by with Walter Kaiser, Darrell Bach, and Peter Inns. Um, here's the book. It's one of those three view debate, three views debate books. And so these three guys, uh, Kaiser and Bach and Inns, have three different perspectives. Kaiser is strongly against census plenier. I'll have to define that term later, but just hang on to that for now. Uh, the idea that the New Testament is expanding the sense of the Old Testament idea. And then um, Bach is willing to see that the New Testament develops. And then Enns is more progressive in the sense that he'll say, yeah, the New Testament just misuses it. But it was under inspiration, so it's okay. Um, which is kind of a challenging position. Okay, so another good book. And I, again, I would highly recommend if, if you're wanting to get it in. Uh, one or two more. Osborne's Hermeneutical Spiral. I thought about giving this to you to read for this lecture, uh, but it's good. If you, if you own the updated or even the old edition of Hermeneutical Spiral, that's a good 20-page introduction into it. I disagree with some of his things in there. Uh, so, but yeah, that's standard. We're always going to disagree. You know, every, this is a very, very uh, debated issue, so there's going to be complexities. And then here, the problem of the New Testament use of the Old Testament in Carson's Enduring Authority of Scriptures. Uh, so big tome of a book. And um, it's got some great essays. It's just an anthology of lots of different essays. It's got some great essays in it. Uh, maybe it's a good one to pull from a library. But I mean, it's a good one to own too. Uh, that, one, that one article in there, I can legally give you. I can uh, get that for you as long as I just use one chapter like that. Um, and so I'll make that available. I'll put it in the Dropbox. It's a little technical. So I would say if you're interested in it, maybe start with some more accessible stuff and then work up to it because it's a, it's a pretty technical, assuming some higher level stuff. What I did give you as a homework assignment for this is the first. I gave you, and I'll give you the link during the break. Um, I'm giving you the first chapter from this book, the Three Views book, where he gives you a really good overview. Um, and I think you'll enjoy it. I have a lot of annotations in there. And so there's some things that I really disagree with. So if you see an X, that means I, I wasn't too happy about that. And check marks are things I like. And you usually put a line, just a straight line, if it's also something I want to remember. Um, so anyway, there it is. I'll give it to you in the, in the break on Dropbox. OK, so there are some recommended sources. The last source that I, I'll just put it in now. Uh, there's a Logos module. And the Logos module, I will show you after the break, where in the software, they have built in the ability to pull up what's, what are the, the references, New Testament, Old Testament. And it's super handy. Um, that's, that's the module I use the most on Logos. I'm pretty much an accordance guy, uh, but this is one module that is top notch. So after the break, let's come back. Let's take a look at that. And I'll try to give you the sense of um, just how much intertextuality happens. Okay, uh, we're at 8.57. Let's come back at 9.02. Uh, we're about 25% into the content I wanted to get through. <laughs> so so uh, if you don't mind, we'll just keep, keep our five-minute break like we normally do and so that we can get through as much as we can. So see you at 9.02. Thanks. What I'll do, I'll show you now the Logos module. Um, very helpful. Very, very good tool. Um, and so let me get that up for you here in just a second. Oh, 
where did he go? Okay, we'll just do it this way. All right, um, tell me if you're not seeing it, but I think you should be seeing it. Um, is that right? Good. Okay, what you're looking at, this is a tool that they have within, just within Logos 8, uh, maybe. I think it goes back to 7 as well. Um, and I'm not sure about before that. But it's a tool called the New Testament Use of the Old Testament. Okay, now Accordance has a similar thing. It's not as developed as Logos is. is. Uh, Logos is the, the Logos module is quite a bit more extensive here. And so if you own a Logos package already, uh, this could be something worth buying. This is the thing that I regularly do open Logos for. Um, and there's some other things too, but this is, this is a pretty significant tool. Okay, so the way this is set up, you can organize things. Well, this is just the simplest, just starting in Matthew, and you're just going down through. And so on this side, you have the New Testament like, reference, and on this side, the Old Testament source. And so there's some kind of parallel between the two. Um, so, you know, here, Abra Abraham was the father of Isaac. Abraham became the father of Isaac. It's fairly straightforward, easy one. If I jump ahead, let's go somewhere like this. Um, this is interesting. Matthew 7, 27. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat against that house. It fell and great was the fall of it. And so they're thinking here that we have things like a fall, flooding rain, a wind shattered, the wall has fallen. See? So that's enough, they're feeling like, that these things are linked. This is a stronger one. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and he bore our diseases. Well, you're looking for those words. And so if you're going, looking around for it, you're going to find it in 53.4. Isaiah 53.4, this one carries our sin, suffers pains for us. We regarded him as one in difficulty, misfortune, and affliction. I think you can change the translation over here. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, but they've, they've chosen specific translations as they went along. Okay, now that was the New Testament side. You can flip these if you want. And so you can turn it so that it's organized instead on this side by the Old Testament. And over here that you're looking instead at the New Testament. Um, that might take a little bit for it. There we go. Uh, so now it's organized by Genesis, order of Genesis. And so this side is changing, right? Uh, because this side is in canonical order. This is in the order of the, the Old Testament as it goes. Okay, so there we are. Um, that's one way that you can organize it, but you can do more. So you can, if you want, uh, you can hit Revelation. And by hitting Revelation, what I just did is I turned this now to where everything I have here is just the Revelation sources. And so I'm starting in Revelation. I could have done the same thing technically by just scrolling down a long time. Um, but this makes it a little bit easier to get there. And so I'll see all of the Revelation resources or sources over here. I can flip it around. And so if I want to just see, you know, how does Daniel get used in the New Testament? I hit Daniel. And over here now, I'm going to be looking at Daniel. And on the other side, I'm going to be looking at all of the, the sources that reference Daniel, Daniel 1, 2. Okay, so this becomes a, a, a really good way to just quickly see uh, a book like Daniel, where is it getting used? What's happening? Okay, it gets a little bit more thick than that, though. Uh, because you can start choosing out other ways that you want to narrow the field. So down here, you can narrow it by speaker. Uh, this is the New Testament speaker. And so Jesus doing intertextuality. That's a point I want to build on later. 500 times we find Jesus doing intertextuality. Or scripture is speaking, or God, or Paul, or Peter. Uh, this is the Old Testament source. So in the Old Testament, God was the one speaking, then the New Testament quoted it. The addressee, who is it talking to? Um, and that's the same thing. You could do the same thing in the Old Testament. Literary types, so what kind of genre is it found in, either Old Testament or New Testament. The people that are involved, uh, so people in New Testament or people source, the places, things, even themes. Okay, so there's a bunch of stuff you can do here. Some of these are maybe less relevant or less helpful, but I think maybe what's most helpful is at the top, you can sort things out by illusion, echo, citation, or quotation. And here, I'll just show you one example that's useful, uh, but there's lots of ways you could do this. If you wanted to see Revelation, you hit Revelation. Everything I'm here now is Revelation. All of these statistics over here change as well. And so an interesting note about Revelation is I have zero citations in Revelation. Right? These top four things are your categories. I'll talk about this in a little bit. But citations would be 
things where it says, as Isaiah said, and then it quotes it, as Moses said, or as the psalmist said, that kind of thing, and then a quote. There are none of those in Revelation. And even quotations, there's arguably only two quotations in Revelation. In fact, we can just see them if we want. Uh, here they are. So rule them with a rod of ironism, earth and pots are broken to pieces from Psalm 2. In Revelation 4, they call out, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, uh, which is close enough. Um, so, okay, we have here two places where we could call that a quote. But all the rest in Revelation are illusions or echoes. And it's huge, 413, 175. In fact, Revelation is one of the greatest examples of intertextuality in the New Testament. Again, go back and let's just see, 590 versus the next is Acts 280. <laughs> so it has almost twice as many. No, it has more than twice as many, doesn't it? More than twice as many as the next book. Okay. It's a huge book for intertextuality, but they're all up here in the category of echoes or illusions. They're not citations or quotations. They're not as Isaiah said. They're all just these, these subtle literary illusions. Okay, well, that's interesting. And that's data that you can pull out from here as you're doing things in, uh, in the Logos source. And then you can all, you know, I, I'm very interested by things like that. I want to hit Daniel, and then I want to look here, and I want to see who's quoting Daniel a lot. See, by choosing Daniel, then I can look down these statistics. Oh, Revelation does it a bunch. And then Matthew is the next biggest source. But this should be really striking to you. Revelation is overwhelmingly referencing Daniel. And then when, with Matthew, I think basically, if I remember right, you're talking about the Olivet Discourse and a few other things. Um, okay, that's interesting. That's interesting data. Okay, any questions about the Logos resource and just how to find that useful, how to make, uh, take advantage of that? It's a, it's a, good, it's a good resource. Uh, Brother Kenneth, is this the most comprehensive list? It's pretty comprehensive. Um, in some cases, I'm looking at things that they're calling an echo or an illusion, and uh, I'm not sure. Um, so, meaning though, that they I think are just they're they're very broad. They're willing to say something is an illusion, where I'm not even seeing it. Okay, so. You know, whether you feel like those are false hits or not, false positives, um, it's, it's a broad, they're going for, they're going for a lot. Um, and I'll look at some, we'll look together here at a couple of instances where people argue for smaller numbers than that. So um, here, let's take a look at this. This isn't perfect. I, the shame. I worked on it and then uh, apparently something didn't come through. So I'll have to fix this later. But I spent some time I actually did here, I took the Logos resource and I pulled it out and I put it into accordance so that I could run some of these analyses on it. Now, what went wrong is that the revelation bar here should be about three times as long because revelation is far and away the biggest. And so what happened here is my revelation got cut off. So you'll just have to mentally adjust that for me. Take the revelation bar and make it stretch all the way to the end over here to the edge, okay? And you'll actually further and you'll be right. It's, it's very striking how huge Revelation is. But the other thing you can get here is looking across the analytics, um, you can get a sense of where the other big books are, okay? Um, so you can find, for instance, the, the Mosaic books are big. Um, Hebrews is big. The Gospels are all big. Matthew is, is quite. And then Revelation, you should be saying, but you're not because it didn't work out right. Uh, Revelation is far and away the largest. Another thing I'd like you to see here visually is just the sense of how, uh, how widespread this is. Okay, so if you drop all of these, and actually, like again, Revelation should be continuing. There should be another spike here at the end. But you do get the impression it's all the way across the Bible. Over here in the Old Testament, obviously, because the, new, the, the Logos module is only doing Old Testament, New Testament things. Um, the Old Testament side of it these are the things that are quoted. The New Testament are cited the things that are quoting. And so you can see it, it's spread all the way across. But it's heavier in the Pentateuch. It drops off in the historical books. Psalms is huge. Psalms is a major one. And then in the prophets, it's major. Right? And then finally, I think worth noting is that it's a lot thicker, naturally, in the New Testament than it is in the Old Testament because the New Testament is compressing. So the amount of quotations that the New Testament is doing is, is and should be uh, quite striking. 
Okay, I did another way of putting this into a form. Again, for me, it's just a visual form, kind of helps me understand. So the same process, I was pulling the data from the log Logos, uh, the Logos module, and then I was doing some text manipulations on it in order to get it into a spreadsheet so that I could play around with how the statistics worked out. So let's take a look at it that way. Um, some attempts to try to understand it like that. Okay, so this is another form of what you just had in accordance. But here is the Old Testament side. This is by raw number. Raw number meaning you just count. Okay, so obviously a book like Jonah is only four chapters long. It's not going to have that many. Isaiah is a huge book. Psalms is a huge book. And so they're going to be huge. Okay. And same thing on this side. Revelation is a big book, so you would expect to get a lot. But notice, Revelation is not as long as Acts. Acts is quite a bit longer. Luke is quite a bit longer than Revelation. Even so, the number is huge in Revelation. And so in order to get a better idea of what's going on, let's try this. Let's try putting it per 1,000 words. In other words, we're doing an average. Um, and if I do it that way, I get this graph. This is a little, there's some statistical, you know, aberration that's going on here. Joel's not a, a super big book. And so it looks really huge here, but you're doing a small sample. Still, for the smallness of Joel, you've got a bunch of stuff that's going on in Joel 2 and Joel 3 because it's getting pulled into the Holy Spirit, uh, Acts 2, and referenced all the way across Acts. So there's some stuff like that that is significant, not insignificant stuff. Uh, pull this down so that all the numbers will pop in. Malachi is another one uh, where it's a small book, and it, but it kind of shocks you. <laughs> it's used more than you think. And then Isaiah and Psalms. Uh, the number, like if you did it in number up here, it's huge. And even the statistical average for Isaiah and Psalms is big. Daniel really ought to surprise you, and Zechariah ought to surprise you. These are two books we don't realize how much these books underlie the New Testament and New Testament theology. So some of these minor books, you would expect maybe Isaiah, Psalms, Deuteronomy. I'm expecting those Genesis. Great. Joel, Malachi, Zechariah, Daniel. Maybe I wouldn't have seen those coming. Okay. And then over here on the New Testament side, uh, Revelation again, whether you do it in raw number or average, it's massive. Uh, Hebrews, I would discount Jude. It's so small that the, the, it's a small sample rate, but still there's a lot of illusions in it. Um, and then other big books in here, Hebrews and Matthew are big books for different reasons. Uh, Romans and Galatians are big books for different reasons. Okay, uh, one other thing that I'll do here as a visual is here, this is, again, this is, this is Logos analysis of it, so it's not an inspired thing. But it is kind of interesting. On the Old Testament side, who is speaking when it's quoted? God and then Moses. And from there, the psalmist David. Okay, so that's kind of interesting. More significant, the New Testament speaker side. This ought to really strike you. Jesus quotes the Old Testament more than anybody else by a long shot. So... A point that I want to make later is that intertextuality is not just a New Testament epistles phenomena, but the phenomenon of intertextuality begins with Jesus. Jesus really established the trend line for New Testament intertextuality. Okay. Um, that's a big deal. I think that makes a very, very significant point here. Uh, Duncan, you... Um, Asked here, uh, am I suggesting the only books that aren't quoted are Ruth, Ezra, and Nehemiah? If I remember right, those are quoted, but they're not quoted enough that I pulled them into the chart. In fact, I think I have that data. Let's pull that. Let's go back over to the outline, and I think I talk about there's just a handful of books that are not quoted at all. Um, so that itself is an interesting data point. Okay, so we're asking the question here. We're trying to figure out uh, how extensive is intertextuality? And let's talk about that for just a second. Um, Nicole discusses the extent of it. A very conservative account lists 900, 295 separate quotations. Uh, maybe I'll just have you read this later, but some things to highlight here. Some are quite extended. Uh, if you work this out, 278 uh, different verses of the Old Testament are cited. In fact, there's an interesting statistic. I guess I forgot to drop it in. But if you do the math, it's something like one out of every 15 or 20 or something of the New Testament verses has some kind of illusion or citation in it. It's, it's, it's a high ratio. 
In other words, a big chunk of the New Testament is actually the Old Testament, just brought in in various forms, allusions, and so forth. Um, it exists in every book of both Testaments, except for Song of Solomon, Obadiah, and Philemon. Now, this statement right here, those three books being the only ones that have no Old Testament or New Testament citations. Um, you'll see, you'll read all kinds of things. I, a lot of times in this list, I read Ecclesiastes. I've ever, even Colossians. I've read a list that included Colossians as having no. I disagree. Um, in the case of Ecclesiastes, I think, I'll put those together. I think Colossians is quoting Ecclesiastes when it says whatever your hand uh, finds, or let's see, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. That's the Ecclesiastes quote. In Colossians 3, you have this similar parallel that you do your work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. And there's enough between the two. I think those are echoing each other. So there you go. Ecclesiastes and Colossians, just like that. Um, so you'll see different things that are out there. And it's a question of what you regard, because this is another interpretational question. Do you think that is a legitimate, uh, is that a legitimate intertextuality example or not? Okay. Um, so there we go. I answered uh, Brother Duncan's question. Um, Okay, one other thing I wanted to say about this is here, Romans has a striking number of citations. Stri citations meaning, I should have explained this or described this earlier, when you have a Isaiah said, Moses said type, that's a citation. Particularly, if you go to Romans 9 through 11, and you do, try this sometime, read through Romans 9 through 11, and take a look at how often this is, Paul is citing the Old Testament, okay? It's very, very striking how often he is pulling in Old Testament citations in order to make his, in order to make his point. And that's because Romans and Galatians, and then secondarily Hebrews, are big books for demonstrating that, that there is not a separate gospel for the Old Testament. And so it's not an accident that Romans and Galatians and Hebrews are also the books that have the most Old Testament citations because they're making this point, things like Abraham was saved by faith because look, he was saved before the law. Okay. Uh, these books, Galatians, Romans, and, and Hebrews would naturally be full of citations because of the point that they, they're trying to make. Okay, any questions about uh, any of that? Trying to, trying to demonstrate as best I can in a short period of time how significant this is as a phenomenon. See any questions yet? And so if not, I will keep on moving. Okay, um, let's go down to the next then and make sure we're, yeah, pause our share here for just a second. Uh, good, some question here, can we include Paul as a kind of Old Testament theologian? Sure, I'll go with it. Um, the idea being that when I'm reading Paul, he's doing theology from the Old Testament. So yeah, all right, that'll work. Okay, my next point here, let's go back and get the overall, get our, get our bearings overall at what we were trying to do here. Uh, my next point was to try to give you a process for analyzing intertextuality, as in what you should do. So what we were talking about here, what is intertextuality? The definition, phenomena, how widespread is it? Then our next point is how to study intertextuality. And so what do we do? How do we, how do, we do the analysis? How do we get into this? So here, Beale, and this, I'm taking this from the handbook. Um, Beale will give us a process. Uh, let me get this, get this link going for us. Um, Beale will describe a process for how you would analyze, starting with, essentially, you analyze the Old Testament context, you analyze the New Testament context, and then you start putting the pieces together. So let me show you what that looks like in his framework. Um, and this is, like I said, taken just straight out of the handbook on the use of the Old Testament. So here we go. He has an, a nine-stage process. Um, identify the Old Testament reference. Is it a quotation or an illusion? If, is it, if it is an illusion, then make a, some kind of validation. Analyze the broad New Testament context where the reference occurs. Analyze the Old Testament context broadly. Survey the use of the Old Testament text in Judaism. Compare the text as in New Testament, Septuagint, Ma Masoretic text. And or the, analyze the author's textual use of the Old Testament. Analyze the author's interpretive use of the Old Testament. 
um, in the New Testament framework, and then analyze theological and rhetorical use of the Old Testament. Okay, that's the really kind of complicated way of expressing it. Let me boil it down a little bit so that it's digestible, I hope. And basically what, how, I, where I would end up going if I was just going to make this pretty simple, hopefully not over simple, is that you're carefully analyzing both the Old Testament and the New Testament context well. Okay, so you carefully study the whole framework of the passage in both Old Testament source and New Testament uh, expression. And if you understand the theology of both and the flow of thought in both and how they relate across both, um, then you're in a position now where you should be able to understand what's happening with them. Okay, does that make sense? Uh, just as the, the sheer foundation for where you're getting started. You've got to understand both Old Testament and New Testament context well. Um, from there, you will have to do additional work occasionally with understanding the textual history. Occasionally, there's going to be an issue of was this taken from the Septuagint or the Masoretic text? And Masoretic text means Hebrew, Septuagint means the Greek translation of the Hebrew. Okay. But fundamentally, I think I can boil down all of Beale's nine points, understand the New Testament and the Old Testament context really well with all of their collection, connections, the thickness of them. And I think you'll get where you need to be. Um, step three in, in Beale's framework, step three was analyze the Old Testament context broadly and immediately, especially thoroughly interpreting the paragraph that you're looking at. Um, I'll just comment here, we ought to be aware whether a literary pattern exists beyond the specific Old Testament context. What I mean is, does a phrase or an idea develop as a pattern within the Old Testament? And the New Testament is simply tapping into the, that, that biblical theme. Uh, an example of this would be, let's say, the seed in Galatians. All right. Well, we did this earlier, right? We talked about the seed in the covenants. And when we worked through the seed in the covenants in this chart, we found out that the seed was not just an Abrahamic covenant thing, but it's a Davidic covenant. It's a new covenant thing. Okay, so we've got the seed thing. And then we, I could have tossed in here Genesis 3.15, I mean, there's other places I could go. So this seed thing is a, it's a really big deal. When Paul then in Galatians 3.15 says that the covenant was made to Abraham and his seed, probably referencing Genesis 22. When Paul says that, actually Paul's not just tapping into Genesis 22. It's not like you can just go back and look at Genesis 22 and be done with it. But to really get the concept, you have to know the whole seed chain. So the chain that went from Genesis 3.15 and then into 17 and 22 and Davidic covenant and new covenant, that whole chain. And so when Paul references the seed, Abraham's seed, part of it is, yes, the Genesis 22 seed. But the rest of the story and the reason that I think Paul can argue that it's a singular seed, because by the way, seed is a collective, meaning it could technically be plural. The reason Paul can argue that it's singular, not plural, is because you've got a biblical theological theme that stretched all the way across is pointing you to the seed. And that is definitely and clearly singular. And so it takes kind of the puzzle out of what Paul's doing in Galatians 3 when he tells you that it's the singular seed. It takes the puzzle out of that and it helps you understand why Paul can do that, even though seed is a collective. Okay, so hopefully that helps in there somewhere. Just to recognize there might be broader stuff going on that stretches across the entire Old Testament. And my advice to kind of find those intertestamental links, remember I told you intertextuality is not just Old Testament and New Testament, it might be within the Old Testament. Um, here, the margins of the Hebraic at Stuttgart Benzia actually are doing this for you. And so they'll tell you where a word or an idea comes up a bunch. And if you, if you learn how to read that, there's some help in that. Okay, so essentially we should be asking whether the specific passage or the quotation we're seeing is part of a broader biblical theology pattern, and that will help us. Um, another thing, step four, that Beal mentioned is using the Jewish backgrounds, and I, I want to comment about that for just a little bit. So, uh, even really good guys, this is Osborne, hermeneutical spiral, his chapter in here, he says something that annoyed me. 
uh, he, said, he said, we ought to view the New Testament as basically a, an expression of Judaism or an expression of Second Temple Judaism, I should say. Um, and you can read the essay. I mean, it's, so what he's saying is New Test or Second Temple Judaism is a happening thing, and the New Testament comes out of that. Okay. Um, I, I strongly disagree. And the reason this matters, people will sometimes take a lot of what they'll call rabbinic hermeneutical methods. So if you read like Midrash um, or Pesher, they'll, what they'll do is in these, this kind of discussion, they'll say, yeah, the rabbis had these kind of, kind of odd Jewish ways of doing exegesis. And so they would take this text and they would exegete it or explain it using Pesher or Midrash, these, these rabbinic methods. And so these kind of odd rabbinic methods are what's going on in the New Testament. And so as a modern, as a person who's followed the historical grammatical method, hermeneutics, um, as a modern, it doesn't make sense to me, but that's okay. You just need to go back and understand the rabbinic thing. And I, I, I strongly disagree. I don't think I need to go back to rabbinic methods, hermeneutical methods to make sense of this. I think the New Testament authors are legitimately understanding the legitimate meaning of the Old Testament. They're not twisting it. Okay. Don't turn the New Testament authors into bad exegetes. They're legitimately understanding what was happening in the Old Testament. But to keep on building my idea and not get ahead of myself, uh, Beale helpfully does clarify, we can still use Jewish readings of the Old Testament text the same way we might use modern commentaries. Their influence on the New Testament itself is questionable or, or negligible. But if I read them the same way I might read, you know, I don't know, I pick up any commentary on my shelf, I go, oh, I disagree with that, but that other point shed some light. I can benefit from the Jewish readings, Jewish interpretations in that sense, meaning people before Christ might have picked up on some things that I don't recognize. Okay. And as long as I take that and then I, I correct it by the New Testament, that can be an okay kind of concept. Okay, so that's about all I'll say there because I've got to keep on going with some other things. Uh, any questions? I think I saw something come in, and let me just look at that uh, quickly here. You're correct. You're correct. Uh, so, Duncan, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's not helpful. Uh, Duncan, you're correct. Uh, Osborne is okay, or he's going to, Osborne is going to be concerned with us understanding Midrash. He's going to be understand, he's going to concern, we need to go back, how did the rabbis do it? And he does that. You can see it in his, in his section on this, um, in Hermeneutical Spire. So he talks about, okay, we need to understand what the rabbis did so that we know how to prop. And I'm just going to go ahead and say, I don't, I don't, really, I don't really care what the rabbis did. <laughs> um, the New Testament is speaking legitimately. And I don't need to go back and understand rabbinic interpretation in order to make sense of what's going on in the New Testament use of the old. So, yeah, what you just said is, is, uh, is what I'm arguing. Okay, I'll keep on going. Next major point was the question of recognizing intertextuality. Uh, Brother Zantan a ways back, you asked a, uh, and great, good comment here, that means we can trust the authors of the New Testament in light of um, Jewish tradition. I would say something like trust the authors of the New Testament even when they counter Jewish tradition. Actually, uh, so this is Beale again. And he says, one of the benefits of studying the Jewish background for how they interpreted texts is to see how differently and how willingly, how differently they read some of these texts and how willing they are to just completely disagree with the Jewish orthodoxy of their day. I think that's fabulous. Uh, there are times when they'll, this is the way the rabbis went, and the New Testament says, wrong. <laughs> and, and that's one of the benefits of reading the Jewish background, is just to prove that, no, the New Testament is not just echoing general Jewish beliefs of its day. Um, so, yeah. Okay, uh, so the next point, Brother Zemtan Leon had asked me a ways back here in the chat, how do we know that we're not going too far? And there is a problem, it's, uh, this comes up in Carson's exegetical fallacies, parallelomania. <laughs> Uh, I'll put the word in here. It's a big, big, I, I don't like, I suppose, yeah, I mean, Carson made it up um, or coined the word, but well, Google just recognized it. So um, parallelomania is when you get into 
uh, you find some like, here are three words, and you jump back into some Old Testament text and you find those same three words, but like one of them is and, and the other one is God, uh, and the other one is stone or something. It's like, you know, you're gonna find and, God, and stone in some verse somewhere. It's just gonna happen. So we need some controls here so that we're not just finding any set of random words and then immediately jumping on that as some kind of uh, parallel, because they're not all parallels. In fact, my example right there is clearly not gonna be a parallel. So how do we know? How do we legitimately know that something actually is? Um, I'm taking this from David Minnick's dissertation. Uh, so we'll hear from him, him and he'll talk about this, but this was something he gave and I'll just read through these quickly. There's another, there's another way of doing this just below. Um, so if I find important biblical words like proper names, uh, there's a place I'm working in Hosea right now, and I, I'm not going to remember it. But it uses a proper name, and oh well, I can do this. It can say the house of Jehu. I will visit Israel in judgment to, to deal with the house of Je or the blood of Jezreel. Okay, well, Jezreel is referring back to a historic event. And so God is coming and he's bringing judgment for what Jehu and his family or people around him did at Jezreel. Okay, something like that. It's a strong enough link. It's, it's kind of like, um, you know, so like, remember 9-11 or remember Hiroshima and Nagasaki. As soon as you say those, we all know what we're referring to, right? Okay, so it's that kind of thing. You put in this, this one word and it calls in a whole historical thing. Uh, quotations when there's a verbatim matching of words. Let's say like three would be the minimum and three unusual words, not and and God, but you know, rather specific words. A matching word sequence, which could be, um, you know, if I say something like, I just went to the store and bought milk. And then I say, recently I walked down to the store and I purchased milk. You can see that those two things are very, very parallel, but I substituted in some synonyms, but my grammatical form was so much the same. My idea was so much the same. It's there. Um, allusions, I think if I remember right, what she's doing here is just, there's, there's some kind of introductory, kind of like, as was in the past, or as remembered, or you know, some kind of reference, some kind of way that makes you expect. Uh, as so-and-so has written is gonna be an obvious one. Parallel textual structure and thematic sequence. There's some places, I can look at them later, but there's some places where I have an extended passage. And, and if you follow the thought, uh, they're parallel enough, it's hard to miss. So let's say Daniel 7, one book came before the Ancient of Days with Revelation 4 and 5, right? If you, if you follow those out, Daniel 7, Revelation 4 and 5, the logic of the passages, even if the words are not matching it, the logic is so, so solid. You can't miss it. Uh, common themes and, themes and motifs, motives. Um, and so some theme that keeps on coming up in this text and coming up in this text. And then a more global inner text. So um, political, religious, economic concepts, something that's specific enough that it's just the, the nature of the idea and the nature of the references, they're specific enough that they're going across. Okay, that maybe is a bit more obscure. Um, David Minnick in his dissertation explains at more extent what's going on. This I found as a little bit easier to quickly grab onto. Uh, here are six things that Richard Hayes, who by the way, he was the guy who brought this in as a big concept in biblical studies. Um, kind of the, the father of the, of the current interest in it. And so he said these six things you should expect. Number one, availability. The Old Testament ex text was available to writers and readers. Um, the idea being clearly, you wouldn't want to say that like Moses is referencing something from the book of Daniel okay, because he doesn't have the book of Daniel. Uh, liberals are going to argue things like, well, you know, the New Testament churches probably didn't have an Old Testament in there that they could access. And we would disagree with that. Uh, but okay, clearly we need to pay attention to dates. Uh, volume, how often the repeated words, themes, or grammatical patterns occur in a significant amount. Recurrence, does he use the same context in other places? What we mean here is if Paul, for instance, in uh, Galatians uses the whole argument with Abraham and being blessed and when was Abraham expressing faith, 
and then I go back to Romans and I find the same thing going again. Okay, Paul did this elsewhere. I'm not surprised, right? So when you can find a certain author repeatedly referring to a certain event, or a, even sometimes they'll do this, this certain author repeats, refers a, a lot to Isaiah 41 to 53. See, well then that's, that's not insignificant. That's worth paying attention to. And so you can see patterns like that. Thematic coherence or satisfaction. Uh, the idea of this just goes that when I, when I go from the Old Testament context to the New Testament context, they fit. They're, they're actually matching up. Historic plausibility. It's plausible that the writers and the recipients could have made the connection. I question this just a little bit uh, because a, a liberal might say something like, they never would have figured that one out. That's too, sometimes they'll say, these people were illiterate. These people were slaves. They never would have picked up on that subtle literary reference. And my argument goes that the New Testament was not just written for the contemporary slaves that received it, but that the New Testament was written for all of us. And it has a depth that, that bears up under repeated readings so that even if you read the text 50 times, 2000 years of study, we might still discover things we've not noticed before. Okay, that's the richness of the text. And then history of interpretation. Have other interpreters ever noticed this connection? If I'm the first person in the history of interpretation to ever pick it up, you know, maybe I should think twice before I, I start to try to sell it. Okay, um, what do you think about those criteria? Any uh, question there? Historical plausibility does seem to be begging the question. I agree. Um, yeah, I agree. Summary for all of these points that I've done um, is a good insight that Beale gives, or just it's a helpful thing. He just says, the question of intertextuality moves along the same paths that a general question of interpretation does. In other words, any commentary you pick up, they'll make their case. I think this is what's going on in this passage. What do you do? You read it and you come to a conclusion, do I buy that? You know, um, and so you might read their whole argument. I'm not convinced, sorry. And then another guy makes the case and he brings in three more insights. Well, what about this and this? And you know, oh, well, okay, he turned my view. Okay, so what you're doing with intertextuality is the same thing, right? And so I, I've read papers, recently read a paper where the guy thought he was seeing all these parallels. And so he showed this passage, he showed this passage and I'm looking down and he's highlighting all the words that go across um, this is a guy that was discussing James 5. And uh, I looked at all the highlights across. I just thought, no, nah. I mean, a lot of the words here are just, you know, the words like God and sick and heal. And yeah, you know, I could find that in a lot of passages. I just, I wasn't, I wasn't turned by it. Okay. That's what we mean. Uh, and so the ultimate discussion of intertextuality, you make your case. And if you've got a lot of points for it, maybe you can sell somebody or you know, maybe, maybe it's legitimate. In other cases, another guy's gonna look at it and say, I don't think you have enough data here. Okay. So we're just doing the same thing here. I think that's helpful, at least for me, about how we would process these. Uh, some people might think they see intertextuality and other people don't agree. How to find this? Uh, I'm putting up five sources here that I think are good ways to to find things where this is happening. The Logos module, I kind of think that's the best place to start. I really like it. Um, so it's good. Uh, NA27 in the margins does a really good job of giving you Old Testament references. And so that's just the Greek New Testament, Nesalan. So if you've got that Greek New Testament or I mean, 27, 28, whatever edition you have, uh, the margins are, they're good. Uh, Beal and Carson, that's the textbook for this course, the commentary on the New Testament's use of the Old Testament. Excellent resource. So go for it. Um, if you can purchase it, try to. I, I hope you will. And then two more, and these are free uh, because they're older, 1855, which again demonstrates my point that somebody before us was aware of this stuff. Uh, so this is not a new concept at all. And I'm dropping that link in the chat. By the way, I did put the PDF for my notes here into the Dropbox, and so I'll, I'll paste that in later. Everything you're seeing here, you'll have as a PDF. But these two sources, uh, the first and then just put them one after another, are, they're good. This one right here is particularly good, uh, and they're on Google Books, so feel free to grab them. I got that from Beal uh, in the handbook. 
and he's, he's the one that put me on to both of those. So some free sources you can get. Okay, uh, any questions there or, um, yes, good. Uh, and Duncan, I have, I, I forget how I got this, uh, but I'll pull it up here. I think I went through and <laughs> I got enough like previews from different places, like Google had, gave me a preview and then I think Amazon gave me a different preview or something. And I was able to scrap together enough of that that I think it's also in the Dropbox. So give me just a quick second here. Um, of that, like at least a significant piece of that. No, okay, I'll have to drop it in there later. But that's another good one. It's really good and it's really thorough. So um, I'll put that in the Dropbox for you guys after we finish the, the discussion tonight. But I, yeah, I like that. Uh, what I like about that one is he also will give you Septuagint or Masoretic text. He'll kind of analyze for you which one uh, they're coming from. It's, it's, yeah, you're right. It's, it's not a good reading book. Uh, you know, you're definitely not gonna sit down and read it, but it's a good reference book. Okay. Um, <laughs> Good, I'm gonna keep on moving. It's a good question, Brother Zambalian. I don't think I can hit it in the time I have. So I apologize, I'll keep on moving here. Um, let's look at this, types of intertextuality from Beale. Um, I will just show you these and then Lord willing in a future lecture, I'll come back to this because there's a lot of content I, that would be worth looking at. Let me just show you the categories that Beale gives. Again, this is from his handbook. But the ways that intertextuality can happen and then Lord willing, we'll come back and talk about this in a future lecture. A uh, direct fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy is just a stuff like, um, you know, where, where the scripture just said, okay, John the Baptist would be one sent before my face. It's John the Baptist, you know. Um, so these kinds of things where it's just explicit and there's no question. Indirect fulfillment of a typological prophecy are things, if you want to think things like the Passover lamb, not a bone would be broken. Well, there's nothing in the Passover lamb, like in Exodus, that tells you this is a person or this is the Messiah, right? But there's enough detail there when this happens and Jesus' bones are not broken, it fits, it goes together. Confirmation and that an Old Testament prophecy will be fulfilled. These are things like Second Peter, the new heavens and the new earth, that's predicted in Isaiah 65. But when you're getting to the New Testament, Second Peter quotes it, and Revelation quotes it to tell you, by the way, this has not yet happened, right? And so this is still coming. Now, what's really fun here is when Beale talks about this category, he only gives that example. Because if you know Beale, he's an amillennialist. And, and so the only thing really for him that's unfulfilled is this new heavens, new earth. Well, Jesus returned, I suppose. Um, but things like Daniel 7.25, I look at that, um, this is, so, you know, I look at this or Zechariah 12, they'll look on him whom they have pierced. I look at these kinds of prophecies, the Antichrist. I mean, I can look at a bunch of things. This is the time, times, and half a time. So the three and a half years. I look at those and I say, those are future prophecies and they've not yet been fulfilled. And intertextuality is telling you it's still coming. But Beale doesn't, he doesn't read them that way. Okay. So I have a lot more in this category than Beale does because I'm a premillennialist. Um, if you're interested in more discussion on that, you can look at the videos from Dr. Collins' lecture. Old Testament uses illustration or analogy. This is, for instance, the, uh, the oxen in 1 Corinthians. And so you weren't supposed to muzzle the ox that was treading out the grain. And then Paul says, he's not talking about oxen. And he does that twice, which again is interesting. You have an authorial thing. He's using the same passage twice. Okay, well, it's, it's an illustration or an analogy kind of argument that's going on there, linking those two. Uh, showing authority, if they cite the Old Testament, like let's say Ephesians 6, uh, Ephesians 6, 1, I think it is, honor your father and mother. So they, they cite an Old Testament command, the Ten Commandments, and they say, you've got to do this, right? There's some kind of authority link there. Um, I'm going to skip some of these. I Here, I made a note that that's Beale's category. I'm not impressed personally, but however... Uh, this one is interesting. Extended exegesis or thematic parallel of an Old Testament text. I gave you this example earlier, Daniel 7 to Revelation 4 and 5. A long passage 
that is resonating in another long passage. Um, here, you've got even a broader, the whole book of Daniel, and that's showing up in places in Revelation in rich ways. Galatians has a lot of rich roots from Isaiah 49 and 55. So you could take a look at Beale's handbook. At these, I, I could give you the page numbers here. And in his handbook, he, he talks through some of these and shows those, explained. Maybe one more I'll show you. Um, well, here, let's do this. Representing general Old Testament language with no attempt at quotation. You've got passages like these. Uh, pop these up for you. And they're, they're passages that are talking about Old Testament language, but they never, it's not like they're intended as a quote. They just sort of use the language in a general way. Um, so here. Uh, I've got the wrong reference here. We'll try 14. Um, no, 15, 16. Well, it's the end. Oh, I know what happened. There's a textual variant there. Uh, so we should probably have done it in the other gospel. Uh, Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Okay. Well, here you have language. They speak of the glory of thy kingdom, talk of thy power. Thou king, our king of kings, the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. Um, the words are not real tight, but you do get the sense that the kingdom, power, glory, this is kind of like biblical language. And somehow, yeah, okay, it's not a reference at all. But it, it's like, the bib that sounds like general biblical language in kind of a, a very general sort of way. And that's an illegitimate idea. Okay, the last thing that's interesting is ironic or shocking inversion. And what I mean by this is there are places, I think, where scripture is intentionally surprising you by using an Old Testament passage in a way that you never would have anticipated. So try this, um, Hosea, talking about Israel, I will say to my people, to those who are not my people, you are my people, and he shall say, you are my God, right? So this is clearly said to Israel, okay? But then when I come into Romans, that's applied to Gentiles. And so there's this big, you can make all kinds of conclusions and do a covenant theology out of things. The Gentiles have, have, have replaced Israel or something. I don't think so. I think it's really simple. What's going on here is something that you thought was strictly Jewish oriented. Then in some surprising way, God is saying, yeah, and I had even more at stake. And so I'm bringing in Gentiles. And in some ways, Gentiles are the fulfillment of the Hosea passage that was actually originally Jewish. And I say it's a surprising reversal because uh, the original way that it was written it's almost like turned on its head, but it's still legitimate. It's still a legitimate reference to that. That's about all I will do with that. Okay, uh, we have seven minutes, so I'm gonna keep on moving as quickly as I can. And then as I said, we'll come back to some of these things in the future. But I'll try to give you an overview of some of this so that you have an overview as we're going into our future lectures. The problem of intertextuality. The problem we're talking about here is the issue I brought up at the beginning are the New Testament authors using texts in a way that is not actually fitting the Old Testament context? So are the New Testament authors actually distorting Old Testament texts? Okay. Um, here's an example of this that's kind of striking this, this way. So um, let's take a look at Acts. Brothers, the scriptures had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas. He was numbered among us, was allotted his share. And so it is written in the book of Psalms, may his camp become desolate. Let there be no one to dwell in it. Let another take his office. Okay, go back and look at the Old Testament context. You know, I don't, you wouldn't have come up with Judas. Right? But, but David says this is about Judas. Excuse me, Peter says that David was talking about Judas. So is Peter twisting the text? Because nothing in the original context Old Testament text seems to be pointing to a Judas figure. And right? so it's, it's like he just reached back in there and grabbed something, this will do, and kind of slap that in there. Right? And so is this a distortion or is this a legitimate use of the Old Testament? That's the problem. That's what I'm calling the problem of intertextuality. Um, where we're trying to figure out, are they, are they legitimately using, say this, if you did that in a sermon, 
would people be impressed with your exegesis or would they say that's eisegesis? See, and I think, I think if you did that in a sermon, they would call it eisegesis. Okay, so what do we do here? Well, here are five questions that Jonathan Lund asks, and he's asking this, this is in this book, uh, the, this, it's the chapter that I gave you to read, all wrapped around the more basic question of the relationship between the Old Testament and New Testament authors and hidden meanings. And so he asks these questions, um, is census plenier an appropriate way of explaining the New Testament use of the Old Testament? Census plenier is, it's, it's kind of a form, Brother Kenneth, good comment here, Peter is an apostle. It's kind of a form of that. Census plenier being, well, they were inspired. And so they could use the Old Testament in ways that I can't. In other words, Peter could just say, under inspiration or under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, I guess Pentecost hadn't happened yet, but anyway, under the, the guidance of God's sovereign hand, Peter could say, this is referring to Judas. And we say, okay, yep. you're an apostle. God's leading you. It's recorded here in Acts. Um, and so Matthew can record, you know, he was a Nazarene. He will be called a Nazarene. Or out of Egypt, I have called my son. And we say, you know, doesn't it doesn't seem, I wouldn't have ever guessed that, but God said it, right? So that's a solution. That's a way to do that, okay? But that's a question. That's a, a big, pretty involved question. This book right here is basically these three guys fighting it out on that question. <laughs> Is that a legitimate concept? And, well, anyway, there's some other discussions we should ask. One of them would be, if the New Testament itself is doing things with the Old Testament that I should not do, that's a little troubling. In the sense that, basically what we're saying, don't follow the example of the New Testament's exegesis. What we're saying is, what the New Testament did, you shouldn't do. I, you know, do you want to say that? I don't know. <laughs> okay, so I think there probably is some limited sense of census linear, but that's a question we're going to have to discuss. All right, uh, to say that the New Testament is doing things you shouldn't do, I don't know. Okay, um, second, how is typology best understood? And I wish we could talk about typology. We have a big discussion down here that I put in here. We won't get to it, obviously, um, but Typology, when you have things, the kind of core example that sticks in my brain is the Passover lamb, not a bone will be broken, not a bone of Jesus was broken. Jesus is the Passover lamb. So that's telling you back when the Passover lamb was given, the Passover lamb was pointing ahead to Jesus, right? Okay, so how far does that go? And so is Noah a type for Christ? Is Joshua a type for Christ? Um, how would I, how would I prove that they are or that they aren't? All of those kinds of, and then what is typology in the first place? How do we understand the phenomenon? Phenomenon. Um, those kinds of questions are big questions. Do the New Testament writers take into account the context of the passages that they cite? So when Paul, or let's say Matthew, we'll go back to that, out of Egypt I have called my son. When Matthew uses that, do you think Matthew bothered to go back and read the context. Is he quoting it out of context? See, depending on how conservative you are or how you answer these questions, some people will say, oh yeah, these guys were misusing text. They just kind of threw at these texts out. Or and the other solution is to say, well, you know, the Holy Spirit just said it. That's that. Okay. But I would like to argue that they are using these passages in context. Okay. It's gonna get complicated but that's the way I would like to argue. Does the New Testament writer's use of Jewish exegetical methods explain the New Testament use of the Old Testament? He's sort of asked this question in a way that presumes that they are using Jewish exegetical methods. I deny that, um, or I'm at least very reluctant. I, I think they're using legitimate exegetical methods. Okay, but again, that's another question you have to answer. Are we, here's a big one, are we able or should we replicate the exegetical and hermeneutical approaches to the Old Testament that we find in the writings of the New Testament? Is the New Testament setting an example for us that we ought to follow or not? Okay. Another very big question with a lot of implications to it. All right, well, that's it for time today, tonight. So um, I'm going to 
give you this as a PDF. In the future, what we could do, I've got a number of spaces, especially in November, that I'll, I'll look forward to spending with you. But we can talk about typology. We can talk about census planar. What is it? Uh, some key theological foundations from Beale. And then uh, that, these are those theological foundations. And then a theology of intertextuality. There is a bunch of stuff that is theologically significant. And so intertextuality is, it's not just a phenomena, there's, there's a theology behind it. There's, there's, there are big concepts behind this that are part of our understanding um, the whole framework of scripture. And then the last thing I had down here is practical uses of intertextuality. And so I'm talking about how ways, I mean, each one of these is a sermon I've preached, well, except for this, that's Brian Collins, but a sermon I've preached uh, using its intertextuality. I never used the word, but that's what was going on there. And if we get this, um, this becomes a very beautiful part of our Bible study. It'll help enlighten the text in so many ways. So it becomes a rich study. And uh, as we work together in this course, I think, we'll, I think we'll start seeing that. Okay, reminder, when you're coming back in, you've got uh, Sam Saldivar is our next teacher talking about Jonah. He did his dissertation on this, and we're starting at 8.30, and that's because of his time zone, just how some things how work out for him. So 8.30 instead of 8, and that means a later finish to 8.30 to 10.30 on Thursday. Um, and then I'll paste in here for you one more time the Dropbox folder where I have our materials for today's lecture. So I'm putting that link in if you want to grab that. If you will read, please, uh, if you'll read Lundy for next time, and that, that excerpt is there if you have the physical book, that's even better. Um, so you can pick up that uh, as a PDF in the Dropbox folder that I've just given you, as well as the notes for today. So uh, I'll make sure, as well as a couple other materials, I'll drop in there different things I showed you tonight. I'll get all those into the Dropbox, and then I'll see you back uh, at 8.30 on Thursday. So thanks a lot. Have a good night.